following Schoenberg uh, came John Milton Cage Jr. Now, John Cage was an American composer, music theorist, writer, and artist. John Cage was greatly influenced by Arnold Schoenberg, who we already mentioned, and another teacher named Henry Cowell. Now, Schoenberg was a great influence on Cage. Uh, Schoenberg even told Cage that he would tutor him for free on the condi condition that he devoted his life to music. Although after two years, Cage stopped when it became clear he had no feeling for harmony. And these uh, classes, per se, would take place at schools such as USC or UCLA. After these uh, sessions with Arnold Schoenberg, John Cage began, began to form his own avant-garde music movement, uh, although John Cage was a leader in this post-war avant-garde, he liked to consider him, his music uh, as experimental instead of avant-garde, which implied a quasi-military forward drive. Now Cage expressed a certain disdain for the conventions of the mainstream classical music, and in this process he was looking for alternatives. Around this time, he discovered Marcel Duchamp, who was, as we all know, the leader in the Data movement. Uh, Cage's piece, Credo in Us, which is a recorder playing squawking random bits of Beethoven or Shostakovich, uh, became the musical equivalent of Duchamp painting a mustache on Mona Lisa, for example, or his ruddy maids with the urinal. Along with the Dada movement as inspiration, Cage, uh, Cage's music was also largely characterized by the random use of sounds and noise. Cage was almost obsessed with the use of noise in his compositions. Because of this constant obsession with the noise in his music, he was known to manufacture his own instruments from brick drums, hubcaps, spring coils, you name it, he would create instruments out of anything, and that led him to his compositions with the prepared piano. Cage's prepared piano was largely inspired by his earlier teacher, Henry Cowell, uh, his experiments with this so-called string piano, where the performer would pluck and scrape the strings of the piano directly. This concept extended over into Cage's actual prepared piano, which typically included nuts, bolts, pieces of rubber, uh, all lodged between and entwined around the strings of the piano. Cage was the first composer to extensively use this instrument and is often credited with inventing this instrument. The repaired piano was a very unique instrument in the sense that it could change the timbre of a note by, for example, placing a preparation between two strings on a note with three strings. A quick definition, timbre is defined as the character or quality of a musical sound or voice, as distinct from its pitch and intensity. So with the prepared piano, John Cage composed his series of pieces called Sonatas and Interludes from 1947-1948. At this point, his compositions were rarely accepted by the public, so he grew disillusioned with the idea of art as communication, but still John Cage pushed on as he wrote this piece. Now, after hearing and seeing this piece actually be played live, you can understand what the prepared piano is actually all about. The metallic noises and the notes that do actually come out were all of Cage's intentions. 
In this particular piece, Cage, as you might notice, uh, mostly avoided the lower registers. He really focused in the higher end of the piano. So throughout this piece, you may hear these metallic noises, and those are a result of using the soft pedal on the piano. Normally, when the soft pedal is used on an ordinary piano, one less string is struck by the hammer of the piano. But since this is the prepared piano, it creates a metallic new type of noise. This series of 20 pieces consists of 16 sonatas and four freely structured interludes in between the sets of sonatas. John Cage's particular goal with these pieces was to express the eight permanent emotions of the Rasa Indian tradition. These eight elements consisted of things such as love, laughter, fury, compassion, disgust, etc. After this, John Cage delved deeper into the Eastern style of thought. Around this period, he became infatuated with the Indian philosophy and the ideas of Zen Buddhism. This newfound interest led him to the idea of whatever happens will happen. This idea contributed to the use of chants in his music. Now, these chance decisions were nothing new of the time. For example, Jackson Pollock would use this chance process with his drip paintings. This new chance method led Cage to a new way of composing, even going as far as to flip coins to determine what would come next in his piece. This new way of composing resulted in some new pieces, such as Imaginary Landscape Number no. 4, or Music of Changes for Piano. Fortunately, after Sonatas and Interludes was introduced, it was very well received by the public, even receiving national and worldwide recognition. This inspiration gave Cage the drive to write one of his next pieces, 4 minutes and 33 seconds. This short clip sums up the entire piece. 4 minutes and 33 seconds by John Cage is 4 minutes and 33 seconds of complete and utter silence. It's very ironic how Cage is obsessed with making music with noise and using all this noise in his compositions, but in 4 minutes and 33 seconds, the point is to create no sound. But upon closer hearing, you may notice that there are sounds in the room itself. While the performer is supposed to make as little sound as possible, Cage breaks the traditional boundaries by shifting the attention from the stage and the performer to the audience and even beyond the concert hall. This entire piece was inspired by Cage's visit to Harvard's Anne Echoic Chamber. This chamber of silence, per se, allowed Cage to hone in on every single little minute sound. This was what he was trying to recreate with 4 minutes and 33 seconds. So in reality, these concerts and records are unique to each and every person. 
So after reviewing these two pieces, we can see how John Cage pushed the boundaries of the norm and the status quo. With his experimental and avant-garde style, this skyrocketed him to fame. Although his work may remain controversial, his influence still carries on on countless composers, artists, and writers. With his prepared piano continuing to live on in modern composers and bands, to his rhythm, rhythmic structure experiments and his interest in sound influencing a number of composers, including Steve Reich. John Cage's breakthrough style will continue to live on and inspire. Following John Cage's earlier avant-garde and experimental styles of music came a new style of music in the mid to late 1960s, pioneered by a new set of composers, including Stephen Michael Reich. Now, Steve Reich, a composer from Juilliard and Mills College, was considered a first-generation minimalist, along with other composers such as Philip Glass. This new minimalist style of music was characterized by constant harmony, steady pulse, reiteration of musical phrases, and in Reich's case, the ability to hear the process happening throughout the sounding music. So with this new style of music in the 60s, one is able to see traces of modal jazz, psychedelic trance, and even rock and roll in Reich's music. Two large characteristics were often paired with Steve Reich's music. One of them being his use of tape loops. The tape loops were exactly as they sounded. They were loops of magnetic tape to create repetitive rhythmic musical patterns or dense layers of sound. His use of tape loops is evident in pieces such as It's Gonna Rain with its pre-recorded voices or Come Out. The other very important characteristic in Reich's music was the use of phasing. Phasing is best described with using this example. Two tape loops are set into motion at two slightly different speeds, so that the tapes begin in unison, but slowly, as time goes on, they shift out of phase. Phasing is seen all throughout Steve Reich's music. His music is also characterized by a strong steady pulse and often repetitive figures. The use of repetitive figures in Reich's earlier music has significantly influenced contemporary music today. With composers and other musical groups, including John Adams, King Crimson, Brian Eno, and The Residents, Steve Reich's influence can be felt up to this day. Although Steve Reich influences many today, he was also influenced by many as a younger composer. With Schoenberg's 12-tone composition, he found the rhythmic aspects of the 12-tone series to be very interesting. And John Cage's work in rhythmic experimentation led to Reich's rhythmic-heavy composition style. The late 60s and early 70s were where Steve Reich really developed his style of phasing. With pendulum music using several swinging microphones all producing feedback to clapping music where two performers would clap the same phrase while shifting apart by eighth notes at the same time. At this point, Reich had decided to embark on a five-week trip to study music in Ghana, learning from the Ghanaian drummers there. Around this time, Reich also studied the way of Balinese drumming. The inspiration from both of these experiences led Reich to compose the new piece, Drumming. This 90-minute piece was composed for a nine-piece percussion ensemble with female voices and a piccolo. This ensemble later went on to become what is known as Steve Reich and Musicians. This ensemble was the solo ensemble for interpreting his work for years.
So as you have seen and heard, this piece appears to be very complex, when in reality is perceptually complex. This is all due to Reich's phasing technique. The power of his phasing lies in its ability to produce highly complex interactions between layers of activity in an easy process through this ensemble. The first section really shows the process of Reich's phasing technique. The bongos start off by playing the same exact rhythm, and as time goes on, they may appear to be playing different rhythms, when in reality they're still playing the same rhythm, except they're using the phasing technique, which causes them to be out of time with one another, creating this concept of perceptual complexity. Now, as stated earlier, this piece was largely influenced by Ghanaian drumming. The connection with this piece and Ghanaian drumming is the use of African polyrhythmics in Ghanaian drumming. The word polyrhythmics means exactly what it sounds like. Many rhythms all played at the same time. So with the many phasing layers in Reich's piece, it appears to have this polyrhythmic structure. This piece is also known to have used interweaving and interlocking of these rhythmic figures but with different pitch levels, thus creating a single line. You may have noticed how these different figures and different pitches lined up in the second clip, which is a clip of the beginning of the fourth movement. Overall, this piece consists of four parts. The first part contains four pairs of tuned bongos. The second part contains three marimbas and two female voices. The third part with three glockenspiel piccolos and whistling and the fourth part contains the complete ensemble. As mentioned earlier, one large characteristic of minimal music is a steady, strong pulse. This aspect is overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly present in this piece by Steve Reich. Again, this strong, steady pulse is what has inspired contemporary musicians today. In 1974, a few years after Reich wrote Drumming, he began his work Music for 18 Musicians. This particular piece was a response to his earlier works, which used instruments of the same color and timbre. Originally, he wrote this piece for his ensemble, Steve Reich and Musicians. Now, the ensemble, Steve Reich and Musicians, plays it with 18 people, but in reality, no other ensemble plays it this way. This is due to the fact that several people in this ensemble would double on more than one instrument for this piece. A unique aspect of this piece and many of other Reich's pieces is that there is no conductor. It was a pivotal decision in giving the conductorial responsibilities to all 18 people. This allows all of them to play together, move together, and be one as they play this piece. This also allows each member to be aware of each other. As a result, there is a lot of audible internal cueing, most, most obviously in the vibraphone and the bass clarinet. Now this means that when the ensemble is ready to move on to the next portion, either the bass clarinet or the vibraphone will give an audio cue.
These specific clips of this piece show exactly where the bass clarinet and the vibraphone cause the audio cues for the ensemble to move on to the next portion of the piece. You may have also heard Reich's phasing and his strong steady pulses. Overall, this piece is written for one violin, one cello, two clarinets doubling the bass clarinet, four women's voices, four pianos, three marimbas, two xylophones, and one vibraphone. Reich describes his piece as having more harmonic movement in the first five minutes than in any other complete work of his to date. Another common theme in minimal music is the reiteration of musical phrases. This appears particularly, particularly in this piece when elements of one section will appear in another section, but they're surrounded by different harmonies and different instrumentation. Another key aspect to this piece is the chord structure and progression. A chord is basically defined as any harmonic set of three or more notes that is being heard simultaneously. Overall, in this piece there are 11 main chords. Using breaths as a type of time signature, each chord is held for the duration of two breaths. Then, each chord is gradually introduced into the piece. This occurs until each chord of the ensemble is being played, and then it returns to the first chord. This style of chord progression is what causes the pulse for the entire piece. After Reich's golden age of phasing in the 70s, he went on to write more complex and newer works in the 80s and 90s. These explored the pitch of taped and sequenced voices, and used these voices as a melodic material in the accompanying uh, instrumental ensemble. In the 2000s and 2010s, Reich has continued with, the, with these ideas, all the while still keeping his phasing roots in place. As Steve Reich continues to create new music, he continues to inspire contemporary rock and electronic types of music. His pieces will live on in rhythmic glory.